Let us then make all we write very good and sound. Manx timber, Manx corking, Manx bolting, Manx everything. Manifestly, we shall not appeal to strangers, nor in fact hope to make a penny. Neither will the Manx public defray the expense of pen and ink and paper. We must make a long arm and stretch back and grip the receding past. Don't care a scrap if we run the risk of being unintelligible to the rising generation. That is of no consequence. Let us execute our office faithfully and lovingly. In short, we must be both daring and modest. Manx Radio have produced this short program to celebrate the birth and indeed to some small extent the life of our own great Manx national poet who was born on the 5th of May 1830. Thomas Edward Brown, the fourth son of a family of ten children, born to the Reverend Robert Brown and his wife Dorothy. She was a great lady, and how she coped with her sacrificial role in the raising of this large family in a situation of pastoral responsibility but economic poverty, no one alive today can possibly imagine. But we can imagine and remember his beautiful verse and music. And it is appropriate that we should start this little celebration with the lovely Eleanor Shimon singing Fly Away Bark, the words of course by Brown, the music by J. E. Quayle, and O oh Gentle Airs. Eleanor finishes off these three songs with that lovely poem, Sing Zephyr Sing, again with J. E. Quayle's music. Most listeners will recognize and appreciate the delightful accompaniment of Mavis Kelly.
We have been honoured today, as I've said, to take part in this programme of celebration in the presence of arguably the finest contralto and teacher of music ever produced by the island, Mrs. Elna Schumann, and the very man to sing the men's songs of men, Cleveland medalist, and you can't go much higher than that, Geoffrey Corkish. Dorothy Lees, a well-established and very popular exponent of Manx works, and Dolan Kelly with Michael Neal are here to deal also with the recitations. Dolan will now recite with fiddle accompaniment an extract from Tommy Big Eyes. And Tommy had a fiddle too, and I don't know what was that he couldn't do with the under fiddle, the way it'd mock everything. It'd crow like a cock, it'd hoot like a donkey, it'd moo like a cow, it'd cry like a baby, it'd grunt like a sow, or a thrush, or a pigeon, or a lark, or a linnet. You'd really thought they were living in it. But the tunes he was playing, that was the thing. Like squeezing honey from the string, like milk in a fiddle. No jerks, no squeaks, and the tears upon the mistress's cheeks. And sometimes he'd play a dance, and what harm? But she wouldn't have it upon the farm, the mistress wouldn't. Dancing, I mean. It didn't matter so much for the playing, but she'd often stop him and ask would he change to a nice slow tune. And Tommy would range up and down the strings and slither into the key. And then he'd feather the bow very fine, and a sort of a hum, like a bee round a flower, and out it had come. Oh, Robin Gray, or the lover's ghost, that's the two she liked the most. And the girls that only a minute afore were ready to jump and clear the floor sat still on the form, but uneasy though, and terrible disappointed, you know. And sometimes they'd be coaxing Tommy to take the fiddle out into the orchard and shake his funny bone over a jig or a reel. Something to tickle a body's heel, says one of the girls. And I'll give you a kiss, faith I will then, Tommy, she says. And Tommy, that blushed to the roots of his hair. But still he said, no matter where, if the mistress wasn't willing, he wouldn't. And Tommy will give you a shilling and coaxing away. But he didn't regard them. And anyway, you know, she'd have had them. Many people... Even devotees of the literary works of T.E. Brown forget that he, right from his earliest days, was a great enthusiast about music. And, like his father before him, he composed many songs associated with his love of the Isle of Man. Here is a song about that love, The Manx Sailor's Farewell. Mary Veen, sung by Geoffrey Corkish. The wind is fair and we must part The long, long waves will roll between And I with you Oh. 
For wrap it safe, for wrap it soft, and let the tarring cease clarim. I'll hold you clasped aloft, my Mary Veen, my Mary Veen. And should stern fate our homes destroy, and I on earth no more be seen, I'll meet you in the realms of joy, my Mary Veen, my Mary Dear, my heart can take no rest except to be where it has been. So wrap it in your lovely breast, my Mary Veen, my Mary Veen. Or wrap it safe, or wrap it soft, and let the towering seas clarin. I'll hold you clasped alone aloft, my Mary Veen, my Mary Veen. And should stern fate our hopes destroy, and I on earth no more be seen. I'll meet you in the realms of joy, my Mary Veen, my Mary T. Brown was, as you know, the son of a clergyman, himself an ordained parson, and also, like his father, a schoolmaster. It is not surprising, therefore, that many of his dialect poems concern themselves with life in the schools, and, of course, with equally humorous comment about the established clergy of the Victorian era. But here we're dealing with schools, and here's Dorothy Lees. Now, Tommy was as shy as a bird. Yes, or no, was the only word you'd get from Tommy. So every monkey thought poor Tommy was a donkey. But bless you, Sal, leave Tommy alone. He'd got a stunning head of his own, and his copies just like copper plate. And he'd set to work and covered a slate before the rest had done a sum. But you'd really have thought the poor fella was dumb. He was that shy and bashful, you know. Not a fool, not him, but looking so. Ugly he was, most desperate, for all the world like a sucking skate. But the eyes, the eyes, why, blow the fella, he could spread them out like a rumbarella. You'd have wondered where on earth he got them. Deep drops of blue light with the black at the bottom. Basins of light. But it was very seldom you saw them like that, for he always held them straight on his book or whatever he had, as if he was ashamed, poor lad. And really, they were the most awful size. And so we were calling him Tommy Big Eyes. The way that chap was knocked about was just a scandal. You hit him a clout whenever you saw him, that was the style. Hit him once and you'd get him to smile. Hit him twice and he'd drop his head. Hammer away till you'd think he was dead. And he'd stand like a drum, as if his skin was a sheep's and made for hammering. Then his hair was so thick, it was nice to grab it and pull it back like skin and a rabbit. 
till he'd have to look up as you may suppose and then you could welt him under the nose. Oh, I do believe the cruelest fiends in the world is a parcel of boys in their teens, one of them stirring up the other. But still for all, the devil's mother should have looked a little more to the way the chap was raped. For it tisn't fair play to dress a lad that's gone to school as if he was born to be a fool. Fancy a frill around his neck. And what in the world could the woman expect? And his trousers buttoning outside of his jacket like these fellas that ride in the races. Surely it might occur... Oh, well, she had a deal to answer for. So one day Tommy took the road the very earliest he could and into the school as quite as a worm and claps his basket under the firm his dinner you'd think and waited there till school began but just in the prayer a fella gave a shove first look at Tommy's basket and tuck, 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 and the master stopped and we all of us stopped and tuck, 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 and out she popped, a beautiful little hen, and she flew this way and that way and shish and shoo and over the desks and we all gave chase and she flapped her wings in the master's face and the dignified he turned to look and shoo he says and tuck 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 and away to the window and scratched and tore and the feathers flying. Open that door says the master then. I'm glad to be shot of us, so out goes the hen and out goes the lot of us. Helter, skelter, boys and girls, sticks and stones or anything else. Catch her! Watch her! Stop her! Drop her! Here she is! There she is! Tommy's, I'll swear she is! Tommy's, Tommy's, hop to nay! Three cheers for Tommy. Hip, hip, hooray! And a stone come flying, and a flip and a flutter, and down went the poor little hen in the gutter. And her leg was broken. And take her up. And the poor little thing. And stop then, stop! Here's Tommy herself. And Tommy came, and he stood like dumb. It's a dirty shame, says one of the girls, and began a crying. Says an imp, he brought her for Nelly Quine. And Nelly for Nelly. And took and caught her. And Nelly's a sweetheart. It's for Nelly he brought her. So when Tommy heard that, he stooped down low like to take the hen. And the tears to flow most pitiful and shivered all over and look at him Nelly look at your lover but Nelly sprung like a flash of light and her eye was set and her face was white and she put her hand upon his head and was it for me then Tommy she said was it for me and he snuffs and he snivels and yes says Tommy hooray says the devils then Nelly faced round like a tiger cat. You brute, she said, get out of that. Get out, you cowards. And her face all burned with the fury of her. And she turned and she took this hen that Tommy confessed. And she coaxed it and put it in her breast. And kissed and kissed it over again. My own little hen. My own little hen, says Nelly. Brown described Geoffrey Caucasus' next song as a lucubration. <laughs> I had to look it up. That is to say, a composition of a learned or too elaborate and pedantic character. Well, maybe it is. But Brown loved to sing it for the entertainment of his friends while he was still fairly young. Which, of course, he always was. I 
I once did love a pretty girl. Her name was Handsome Bella. It's like enough you knew her well. She lived at Palacella. There once a week at Mother Cow's, I sat and got quite mellow, and with a score of cheerful songs, I rejoiced at Palacella. But still the girl a notion took, she loved another fella, and I was down upon my luck, down, down at Palacella. And though I drank the foaming quart, genteel there in the parlour, she wouldn't be my own sweetheart, this girl of Palacella. The tastiest I always dressed, the more that I did swallow, which universal was confessed by them at Balasella. But all I'd done with freak and fun, she married Jimmy Callum. Impossible, I think it's still this girl of Balasella. And yet I spread above her head my fine silk umbrella. She did not see the spirit this girl of Balasella. So with this grief that fortune gives, I'm turning green and yellow. I'm dying now, but still she lives. She lives at Palacella. As I said before, T. Brown was always ready to pull the legs, not only of the established clergy, but of the Manx laity as well. He had seen it all, and he did just this, in the coach, on the way from Ramsey to Douglas, perhaps. Here's Dorothy back to tell you all about it. What's the good of these parsons? They're the most desperate rubbish going. Regular humbugs they are. Show me a parson, show me a drone. Living on the fat of the land. Living on the people's money the same as the drones as living on the bees as honey. Oh, bless you, the use of them. Not the smallest taste in the world, no. Grinding down the honest working man, just so. Sucking the blood of the poor and needy. And as greedy's greedy. See the tithes, see the fees, see the glebes and all. What's the call for the neck? And their wives going to taken for ladies, and their children going sent into college like the fuss of the land. Oh, it beat all knowledge the uprisement of the lick. And fingering with their pianos, them that should be singing their hosannas to the king of glory constant. Clap them in the pulpit there. What can they do? Oh, come down the steer, come down the steer, and don't be disgracing yourself that way. That's what I've been thinking many a time. And let a preacher take his turn, a local. I just try him. Or oh, give your people a chance to get salvation. You can't be married without a parson. Can't I, though? Can't I, Master Crow? Give me the chance. I'm a married man with a family coming, but if it pleased the Lord to take Mrs. Crea, 
Do you think there's a woman had refused to go with me before the high bailiff down at Castletown and get a slicker matrimony put upon us? Honest? Yes, honestly, you are. But holy, holy matrimony, they are saying. Holy, your grandmother. At least, I mean, I'm asking your pardon, Mrs. Clegg, but the ridiculous people, Elizabeth, the lucky under. <sighs> Easy with your leg, Master Carla. Thank you. That, that'll do. Yes, Mrs. Clegg, and christenings and funerals too. Superstition. Just superstition. The whole kit. Most horrid. Just poverty. Clean poverty, that's it. Ay, poverty and scheming and a lie and a delusion and snares to get money out of the people, which is the Lord's and not theirs. Money, money, every turn. Money, money, pay or, or burn. And where does it come from? I said it before, and I say it again. Out of the sweat of the working man. Oh, these priests, these priests, these priests. Down with them, I say. The brute beast has more sense to us that's willing to pay blackmail to a set of rascals to a pack of... Good evening, Parson Gale. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Step up, sir. Make room. Make room for our respected vicar. And may I presume to... Ax, how is Mrs. Gale, sir? And the family? Does this weather agree? Rather damp, I dare say. And the governor's got knighted. I'm delighted to see you, sir. Delighted, oh, delighted. Over the years, some foolish people have cast doubts. Or have tried, perhaps, to introduce a controversial aspect into the life of our wonderful Manx poet, to cast doubts upon his holy Manx nationality. I maintain this is a load of rubbish. To me, he, like his father before him, could not have been more Manx, and certainly not more devoted to our beloved island. And now we end our birthday programme with Dolan Kelly and Michael Neal rendering one of the manifestly best literary examples of the love which T. Brown had for his homeland, our homeland, the Isle of Man. I'm here at Clifton, grinding at the mill. My feet for thrice nine barren years have trod, but there are rocks and waves at scarlet still, and gorse runs riot in Glenchas, thank God. Alert, I seek exactitude of rule, I step and square my shoulders with the squad, but there are blaberries on old Barule, and Langness has its heather still, thank God. There is no silence here, the truculent quack insists with acrid shriek my ears to prod, and if I stop them, fumes, but there's no lack of silence still on Callaghan, thank God. Pragmatic fibs surround my soul and bait it with measured phrase that asks the assenting nod. I rise and say the bitter thing and hate it, but Wordsworth's castle still at peel, thank God. O oh, broken life, O oh, wretched bits of being, unrhythmic, patched, the even and the odd, but Brada still has lichens worth the seeing and thunder in her caves, thank God. Thank God. <laughs>